You're traveling into another dimension. A wondrous journey deep into a pop culture realm that has influenced generations of fans and filmmakers. An examination of the work and influence of a man named Rod Serling. An exploration we call Deep in the Zone. Hey, it's uh, David Levin, and we are here with another deep dive into episode by episode of The Twilight Zone. And today, I'm really excited because we are going to be diving into one of the least wordiest, is that a word, uh, Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, and it is The Invaders, which stars Agnes Moorhead. And to help us sort of understand this episode, I've invited my friend Herbie Pilato, who, like me, is a historian of fine TV and pop culture, um, classic pop culture, and uh, has written many books, including one of my favorites. I actually found out, that's not the one. Oh, I actually <laughs> found out that I had two copies of this on my shelf. Oh, wow. That's how much I liked it. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's the 40th anniversary edition. It's the 40th anniversary. So, Herbie, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Her Herbie has written many books, including that one. And uh, and as, as as you can see on your screen, Twi <laughs> Twitch Upon a Star. Um, he's written books about Mary Tyler Moore and so many others. And we'll talk more about those a little later in the show. But uh, for today... We're looking at Agnes Moorhead, who, as you may know, played Endora on uh, the beloved show Bewitched. So thanks for coming on the show today, Herbie. Thank you for having me, David. Always a delight to talk with you and how to see you and it all be three-dimensional, kind of, sort of. I know. To talk about what we love is great. And I love I love uh, your background. I love your library there. It's, oh, uh, thank you. I have my Twilight Zone background going on and... Uh, um, yeah, well, you know, it's like a green it. screen. It's, it's a like, green screen. <laughs> it's, it, it's disco, disco tw Twilight Zone. It's a disco Twilight Zone. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's exactly right. Exactly right. So, Herbie, before we get started going deep dish on the episode, since this is your first time on the show, um, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the Twilight Zone as you remember it? Let's, let's and, and and apart from the ones that you and I are going to be exploring, which is all things bewitched uh, in your wheelhouse talk to me about the twilight zone what was the twilight zone for you growing up well i you know i ran into it you know like i think the rest of of of, of my generation in general because we were relatively too young to watch it the first time around yeah yeah so i caught it in the reruns but i caught it in new york i know in los angeles people are watching it you know, in the 70s, in the early 80s on Channel 5, I believe, KTLA. But I, you know, in, in Rochester, it was, I think, the late 80s, early 90s when I had the opportunity to watch the reruns. I couldn't believe it. I had watched Night Gallery yep. first run, you know, which is, a, you know, Rod Serling's other series. And that was, you know, creepier, spookier. And Agnes actually did an episode of that as well, where she played a a witch. And I mean, what, like a, what, what a coincidence. Yeah. An old crone type witch, you know, like a three witches Shakespearean type thing. Uh -huh. um, so I really knew Rod Serling from that. I knew him from Planet of the Apes. Yeah. And I also knew him from an episode, um, like a documentary that he narrated on Chariots of the Gods, which was, you know, that book by Eric Von Daniken about right. how the aliens came and colonized Earth, allegedly. Right. And uh, yeah, so he narrated that. But he was also from my neck of the woods, kind of, sort of. Um, I'm from Rochester, New York, and he was from Bing Binghamton, New York. There you go. There you go. So do you remember what your first episode was? My first episode. Gosh. I know one that sticks out. Yeah, and that is um, going my way with uh, the beautiful Inger. Inger Stevens. Yeah, um, it was that was scary. That was scary. But I have to say that my favorite episodes of the show, and and I talked about this on Digibits uh, for the fiftieth or fiftieth anniversary, I guess, a couple years mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. or last year, or this year, whatever. Um, 
I hate to tell you it was the 60th anniversary. I mean, 60th, of course. Well, yeah, as I say, I'm 30, so. Right, I'm... right, of course. And, and and me too. I actually, I do this so that I look a little bit more distinguished. I Exactly. I put it in. I sprayed I, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the my favorite episodes of the show is where they would go somewhere. Like, you know, the the little girl who gets lost in the wall uh -huh. or or Gig Young who goes on that train back in time and w to Willoughby. Oh, that's though, actually that's actually uh, uh, James Daly, the father oh, James of Tim, Tim and uh, and and Tyne. Um, right. If I were if right. I was really your friend, I would go back and edit that so that I can make you right. But I would. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's so okay. because Gig Young was married to Elizabeth Montgomery at some point, so we could tie it in right there. <laughs> oh, that's very that's very nice. And Gig Young actually, it should be pointed out, did do a time travel one where he goes back, and that's Walking Distance, one of the early yes. episodes. Yes, yes. But the Willoughby one on the train with James Daly, and then Gig, you know, doing the walk. It's because it, again, it's this place. Yeah. You know, this place that these people go, this different dimension. And that, to me, were the ultimate episodes of Twilight Zone. The twists make it fine, which we're going to be discussing here, yep. you know, in the Agus Moorhead episode, is great. And that made it wonderful. Right. But my favorites are where, you know, they go somewhere. Well, the, the, the you know, the, the, the time travel episodes and, and the nostalgic episodes, he, you know, obviously, and, and we, I've talked about this on the show before, the, the thrilling definitely had a feeling of wanting to go back in time, not just to go back in time, but to go back in his life and to relive a simpler time, a, 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 a yearning for youth or for another, so many episodes, Kick the Can and, and Willoughby and... Um, and that apparently started because he was on the lot one day for many of the episodes. Yeah. He was on the MGM lot one day and it was empty, and he had this feeling of uh, isolation, yes. and also the sense of home, because you know Binghamton and Rochester and upstate, upstate New York, all very cozy, you know Mayberry esque type places. Right. And I'll have you know too, and I don't know if, you, if I told you this before, but I produced or I directed and produced a documentary on Rod Serling that never aired. <laughs> We did it for uh, the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh -huh. It was supposed to be done for the Sci-Fi Channel for a show that they were doing called Sciography. And because I was living in Rochester at the time in the late 90s, early uh -huh. 2000s, um, they said, Herbie, would you be interested in doing this? So it was very interesting because I had this like little studio apartment in Rochester, and I'm producing you know, this, this do major documentary on, on Rod Serling. So, do you want me to tell you the whole story? What please, happened when I went? Please do. That, 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 this is an unexpected treat. Okay. Well, um, they, they wanted me to go to uh, his university, Binghamton University, I'm thinking. And please correct me if that's wrong. No, I think that's uh, correct. Either where he went to school or where he taught. I think where he taught later. Yeah. And um, to talk with, also, also to go to his hometown. I ended up speaking with his kindergarten teacher. Wow. She was alive. Was that Helen Foley? I think so. I think that's exactly what her name was. And he and named one was... of his characters after her. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Perfect. Uh, she was a sweetheart. And then her, her best friend, or his best friend, um, who looked at me and said, You know, Herbie, you kind of look like Rod. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been the eyebrows, I guess. Yeah, well. So anyway, we go to um, where they, I guess they have all his archives of all his scripts yeah. at this particular university. Uh -huh. And we wanted to take some pictures of it, you know, camera, yeah. live action, whatever. And um, so we opened this door, the, the, me and the crew, we open this door and we look and we see these this long corridor, this big closet, really huge, and it's filled with all of these scripts. Now I've written scripts, I, I, and I'm sure, and I know you have as well. You know what kind of work goes into them, whether they're nonfiction or fiction. Yeah. This man had, I mean, it was like looking into the Akashic records. 
you know, they're just just amazing. So we're in on, we're, we're, we're videotaping this whole thing. And as I back up, trying to get one particular shot, I hit a table behind me. And off this table falls a script. And I look down on the floor where it's falling. And guess what the name of the script was? No idea. Herbie. Okay, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> it was Herbie. Now, he apparently wrote some Playhouse 90 or oh. something in the 50s called Herbie. I didn't know this. I don't know why that script was right there behind me on the table. I actually wanted to steal it, and I wish I would have at this point, but I didn't. And it just freaked me out. Wow. It totally freaked me out. And that's my Rod Serling story. That is a very cool Rod Serling story, I have to tell you. So why don't we do a dive in? We're going to do a deep dive into um, the show. And uh, so let's uh, let's cue the music. You're traveling through another dimension. Oh, I love and the that. opening changed a couple different times. Yes. You know. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. This may be the, the most famous the one, I think. Zone, yeah. Zone. Except for the, the door. And the, right. This is one of the out of the way. We'll let him do his. Uh, the unvisited his... places. Bleak, wasted, dying. This is a farmhouse. Handmade, crude. A house without electricity or gas. A house untouched by progress. This is the woman who lives in the house. A woman who's been alone for many years. A strong, simple woman whose only problem up until this moment has been that of acquiring enough food to eat. A woman about to face terror, which is, even now, coming at her from the Twilight Zone. And, you know, and, and it was just so interesting that he would do these intros, because sometimes they would be not, you know, near the set, and sometimes it would be just like a, a separate shoot. Um, but just the fact that uh, he was still combining his reality with this uh, fictional world was kind of interesting. It could still completely believable to us because the scripts were so genius and he was such a genius. The sad part of though, of, of when I would see him do these um, little, uh, you know, hosting segments is he was smoking. You know, and every, that's time, also every time, every time. What killed him, you know, he was only 50 years old and he died in Rochester, by the way. He died in Rochester, New York, which was just so freaky. So but he died so young, 50 years old. Let's do a little bit of bookkeeping. This is The Invaders, which aired during the second season. Uh, it was first aired on January 27, 1961. Um, it was written by Richard Matheson, one of uh, the best and one of my favorites of all the Twilight Zone uh, writers. Obviously stars Agnes Moorhead. Uh, Douglas Hayes was the director and also played the voice of the astronaut and the music was by Jerry Goldsmith, who also went on to do so many things, including five of the original Star Trek movies. Um, where do you want to start, Herbie? <laughs> well, you know, look, look at her chewing. I don't, what is she chewing, by the way? I, I never understood what kind of piece of food uh, she was having. Um, but Agnes Moorhead, my gosh. Okay, obviously years before the glamorous Endora. Yes. On Bewitched. And here she is playing this uh, haggard you know, yeah. haggard woman in the country. Uh, not really sure what year it is. And I guess there's been some uh, complaints, I guess, about this episode that it starts so slow. But I love everything about it. And what's interesting to me, too, is that she doesn't speak um, all. in this episode. Yeah. And in Elizabeth Montgomery's episode of Two, where she plays opposite Charles Bronson, she doesn't speak. One it word. Says one, word. one word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Dick York, in his episode, his main episode of The Twilight Zone, A Penny for Your Thoughts, 
he hears other people's thoughts, but they don't speak. So that always kind of intrigued me. Interesting. You know? the, 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 it's all about their, their acting and their reacting to what's going on. Well, it's, and just the fact that they all were bewitched and they did these silent kind of episodes. Because yeah. this really is a, a, it's like a silent movie, watching it. It's, you know? it's brilliant. Just the fact that you could have a TV show uh, with zero dialogue, basically. Uh, you know, uh, by the way, spoilers are ahead as always on our show. If you have not watched this show, get yourself onto Netflix or Paramount Plus or wherever you can. Watch it and then come back. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but yeah, you will be getting spoilers here. Um, look at look at her face. Look at her. Look at her reactions to to everything that's going on around her. It's just. Now, let's talk about, uh, if you would, Herbie, give me a little history on Agnes Moorhead and her career at this point and what, what she had been doing up to now. I mean, Agnes was one of the most respected um, actresses of the theater. Yep. Um, even, even before film. Yeah. Um, she was one of the original members of the of Orson Welles Mercury Theater. Yep. A very elite group of actors, you know, people like Joseph Cotton was in that group and uh, she just was very highfalutin <laughs> yeah when it when it came to acting and her standards were very very high and when she was first given the script you know she was like where's my line what's going on <laughs> you know um, so she was apprehensive about it really but she did so much she did so much before this and and she had small parts in movies you know later on too and when when they did when they went to color um and but she really really obviously did not come into stardom until bewitched in tv that's when she but, was she, yeah but look citizen kane i mean she you know if you if if you haven't seen citizen kane stop now go watch it come back there may be spoilers but she literally, isn't she the one who threw the sled on the pile? I mean, like the, the catalyst sled, yeah. for the whole thing, the sled yeah. on the pile. And if you haven't gone to see Citizen Kane yet, I'm sorry. We just ruined one of the greatest surprises <laughs> in cinematic history. And shame on you for not heeding my warning yet again. <laughs> well, you know, and it's interesting, too, because the lighting in, in Citizen Kane and this, this episode yes. is very similar. I mean, what they did with lighting is just amazing for this era. You know, today, everything is so dark, and I have major issues with that. And, <laughs> ev and, and everybody mumbles, and I have major issues with that, okay? But, and I think there's a lot of problems with the sound mixing of what happens today. I don't think they plan it like that, but that's how it ends up being. But yep. with something like this, every frame was lit for a particular reason. And it helps to tell the story, yeah. uh, in addition to her amazing face. There is such a, by the way, is that the Jupiter 2, or does it just look like the Jupiter 2? It is from Forbidden Planet. They it used a lot of stuff from Forbidden Planet, didn't they? Yep, yep. They I, Later on, it becomes when she, well, I don't want to give a, a spoiler, but when she- <laughs> Too late. When she kind of like attacks it, okay, it's it's not the Forbidden Planet uh, model. They use a different one, but okay. this one right now in this scene, or or is a Forbidden Planet. Got it. It's Look at face. And what I love about her is that hair. She didn't cut her hair. That's her hair. Yeah. You know, she has this this lengthy hair going on. Uh, she cut it for Bewitched. And you just saw the little space person there. Right. Apparently. Um, they wanted to actually use that kind of toy so that she could ultimately have a, a physical altercation with it at some right. point. There's two of them, I think. Um, listen to that, listen to that. It's strike. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt so bad for her. Don't you feel bad for her? Oh my God, she's terrified. You know, and it's... And you know, you think about her in Bewitched and you think about 
her here, uh, and I'm going to throw up a, a shot of her at, at, at a certain point from Bewitched. The, the vast difference of the Glamour Girl from Bewitched and this which you you know if you didn't know you would barely know that this was the same that, that this was the same actress a testament to her talent a testament to her talent because even the when she would use her expressions it wasn't just about the makeup on bewitched and the and the dresses and the wardrobe that was all great that helped it but it was the way she she moved her eyebrows in that elegant way and it's the way she's using her expressions here yeah. I mean, that is an actress. That's well, she, an actor. She also knew the level to bring to it. Bewitched was a little bit over the top, and she knew how to chew the scenery without over-chewing. Yes. Uh, she knew how to, how to grab your attention. And it was definitely over-the-top acting, but it was not over-the-top for what they were doing and for what the genre was, which is... Such a fine line to cross and not an easy one at that. Right, right. And, and again, it's a, it's a testament to, you know, knowing when to pull back, knowing when not to. Because she was from the stage, this particular form of acting, where she has to heighten it a little bit, um, you know, the, her stage background helped her do that. Because acting for the stage and acting for TV and film are, are really two different things but not in this case because it's really like a silent movie where everything is... Listen to the music. I... Listen to the heavy lifting that Jerry Goldsmith score is doing. And again, The Twilight Zone used some of the greatest musicians uh, of the 20th century cinema, you know, um, and in this particular case, I guess Goldsmith was probably pretty young at the time, but he really holds his own with, with the kind of music that's going on here. Genius. Genius. It's not something you learn. You either have that kind of talent or you don't. Yeah. You, know, you can get all kinds of academic uh, knowledge, uh, you know, in certain patterns or, or whatnot, but... That's just talent. The uh, I love the uh, sound effects. They're so of the period. It sounded oh, they sounded so high tech in 1960 and 1959. You know, it's just old time radio. You know, they just they didn't anticipate some of the amazing uh, things that would be coming. Even in a science fiction, you know, they they couldn't predict so many things that were happening that would be right. happening later. Right. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the cinematography. Um, and I'm just, I'm sitting here watching, let's, let's talk, and you know, each of these episodes that I'm, that I'm doing with people as we're doing them, you know, we talk about some of the people. Richard Matheson, who, um, who my regular viewers will know, wrote so many of the Twilight Zones. And, not just capturing Serling's voice, but creating his own voice as well. Well, he did Trilogy of Terror years later. Yes. Which essentially is the story. You know, a little, little crazy little person attacks, you know, big vulnerable person. Yes. Uh, Karen Black, I guess there, was a, there were three different stories in Trilogy right. of Terror. Right, right. And it was directed by Dan Curtis of Dark Shadows fame. Um, and Karen Black played this woman who was terrorized by this little kind of voodoo doll. Yep. And it, it's, it's very obviously it's the same thing going on here, only they're spacemen. It's very, it's very interesting how many genres the uh, Twilight Zone was able to, to encompass, you know. Uh, and we see it just in these three episodes uh, of, the, of the Bewitched actors with Dick York, which is kind of a comedy, well, not not an over-the-top comedy, but has some comedic elements to it, and this one, which is just pure terror, and then um, Elizabeth Montgomery and Charles Bronson's, which is two, which is, I guess, an early example of post-apocalyptic <laughs> science fiction, which seems to be all the rage now, but back then was few and far between, predicting a not bright future like like Star Trek would predict this bright future 
Um, okay, mom and dad. Uh, a, a non a non bright future, uh, and just you know she's living in some sort of horrible universe here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's 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 interesting too because many of the Twilight Zone episodes and what made them great um, is they were usually not always, um, but usually based on a short story. There was all there was some kind of source material. Mm -hmm. uh, that really the far superior episodes were based on, which I think one of the reasons why any of the new Twilight Zones didn't make it is because they just had these fans of the show, which is lovely, who wanted to write and redo and, you know, not necessarily reboot, but re new episodes. And they try to be, you know, oh, let's put a real twist at the end and let's do this. And then they throw in the vulgarity and, and, and the violence and, the Twilight Zone didn't need that. You know, none of the scripts yeah. of the era or the shows of the era needed vulgarity or violence. They just were good stories that were either created by very talented writers or, as I say, that were based on either novellas or books or magazine articles that were then turned into scripts. And you do not see that today. What struck me about the early Twilight Zones, about all the Twilight Zones, all the best Twilight Zones, is it was they were always about ordinary people thrust into extraordinary circumstances. It was never, you know, it, 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 the, even if they were astronauts landing on another planet, they were just ordinary guys, you know, the Jack Klugman, the Rod, Roddy McDowell, the Jack Warden, the people who were just day-to-day -day guys, and they were and they were thrust into these situations. Um, and that's absolutely right. And not, it wasn't about beautiful people, you know, and I don't mean to come down so hard today on, on contemporary television, because there's a lot of talent in front of and behind the camera, but everybody is beautiful today. Everybody is sarcastic today. Everybody is sardonic. All the characters are the same. Mm -hmm. Back in the day of the Twilight Zone, you had this, you know, 60 year old woman, okay, playing this lead character. Yeah. You know, and in other episodes that, you know, we will explore later, Dick York, obviously a young guy, but there were older people in that in that episode with him. With Elizabeth, that was different. She was beautiful, and yet she was, her looks were toned down for that episode. You just, it's like they're afraid to do those kinds of characters today. They're afraid to make everybody look different. As much as they try for the cultural diversity, they still are like, well, okay, cultural diversity, but everybody still has to be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, part of it, I think also, there's a level of, um, how can I put it? There, there, there's, there's a level of, um, these weren't realistic. They were stylized, okay? The, 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 the Twilight Zone is of a particular period as well. In other words, the writing, as, 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 as Jack Klugman put it, you know, the, the, there was a crispness to the writing. People don't talk necessarily the way they... That's a much more sort of naturalistic dialogue now, but back then, they talked in a certain way. A lot of them spoke just like Rod Serling speaks, even <laughs> if they were the lowest class... There was, but he had a way. Uh, you can recognize Serling's writing in his characters and in his narration that no one else will ever be able to duplicate for a Twilight Zone. Um, I think they. I think they did. I think the '80s version of the Twilight Zone did a fairly good job. I think the '90s to a lesser extent, and. Um, and as much as I was rooting for, for Jordan Peele's version of The Twilight Zone, I don't think they quite hit the mark with it. Um, well, there's just so many different things against it. I mean, this is, to me, Twilight Zone, Fugitive, Route 66, Peter Gunn, uh, Perry Mason, uh, even how Alfred Hitchcock presents, which I still can't watch because it's just there's a murder every week. I can't take it. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's film. It's, there's film noir. And then there's TV Noir. That's how I look at this. Is, yeah. And there's a great book out there, by the way. It's not mine. It's called TV Noir. Okay. And it, it talks exactly about this. So it was a, 
It was a look and it was a style definitely unto its own. And no, people didn't really talk like that in real life. But at the same time, you know, when I was watching the Gold, um, Gilmore Girls, the, the dialogue is so t so dense. You don't talk like that either. And again, not everybody is that quippy and, and smart and witty today like right. they are in TV shows. So. Right, right. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to bring up... You and up... I might be David, but... I'm, I'm very dated. I'm completely dated. Here she's, 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 she's just destroying the thing. She's yeah. tearing yeah. the crap out of it. Yeah. And that is horror. That is... I mean, you have this, this evil thing that she thinks is evil. And she's, she kills it. And now she's just exhausted. So she goes, you know, at the beginning from this, like, you know, relaxed, just cooking, enjoying her life. And then slowly how it builds. Uh, just like I Love Lucy would start out low in the regular world of comedy and then build to the end of, yeah. like, uh, extraneous comedic overtones. This took it the same way, only on the drama level. It's, it's just started out regular to utter terror and coming up, coming, up to, coming up to the twist i believe like a baby sounds like a baby yeah she's she's primal in this she's absolutely primal who would have thought that i would connect i love lucy with her nicely done i can connect i love lucy to uh to, to i can connect superman to gomer pile I'll tell you another time. Okay. <laughs> She's right. so vulnerable. You, she started out tough, and then she ends up so vulnerable. And exhausted. Yeah. And what would we do in the same situation? And believe me, I've thought about it. <laughs> you know? You, you have too much time on your hands, clearly, Herbie. <laughs> I don't. Not at all. That's the crazy thing. I drift. <laughs> Poor thing. She should have got an Emmy for this. Oh, Poor my God. You know, they didn't take this stuff seriously back then. It was just like no. a, a Mike, Mike Wallace in his interview with Rod Serling was like, so now you're doing fantasy. He's like, well, not exactly. Nobody got it. And he really, he really skirted the censors by doing stuff. But this was, you know, this was, I would love to see the script for this because it's got a, it's all description. There's not a speck of dialogue and the director and 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 Agnes and the and the DP all had to sort of come up with this and yeah. fill a half hour. You know, it could have easily been too much or too little. Oh, oh here we go. Get out of my life. Central control. Come in, central control. And that's the Do voice of Douglas me? Hayes. Gresham is dead. Repeat, Gresham is dead. The ship's destroyed. Incredible race of giants here. Race of giants. No central control. No counterattack. Repeat, no counterattack. Too much for us. Too powerful. Stay away. Oh, oh. Gresham and I are finished. Finished. Stay away. Stay away. And your sympathy is 100% for her up until this moment. And yes. then with one simple pan of the camera... It's just, just said for all the way around. Here it comes. So, there you go. There's the twist. <laughs> At the beginning of the space race, also think about where we were. In in right. in the, you know NASA was just a, a baby. Kennedy hadn't even given his speech. Let's go to the moon yet. I don't think. And someone had noted about how this is like the best exit ever. She keeps on going, keeps on going. 
These are the invaders. She's melting. The tiny beings from the tiny place called Earth, uh. who would take the giant step across the sky to the question marks that sparkle and beckon from the vastness of a universe only to be imagined. The invaders, who found out that a one-way ticket to the stars beyond has the ultimate price tag. And we have just seen it entered in a ledger that covers all the transactions of the universe. A bill stamp paid in full and to be found on file in the Twilight Zone. Ugh. You gotta yeah. love it. You gotta love... You gotta love his work. You gotta love when he does this stuff. Douglas Hayes, great job of directing. And Actus Moorhead, Richard Matheson. Uh, think and about... Just so everybody's clear, it was on another planet. This yes. These were representatives of Earth. These were humans that were visiting another planet we assumed she was human at the beginning correct but that was not the case correct she was humanoid but um she was not we we were not on earth um, those little guys were earth so. well there we go and uh next time we're going to be back with my friend herbie Pilato. herbie who uh Great, great to have you here. You added so much to the conversation today. And it's always a delight to talk with you via Zoom, via the phone, via in per one day in person. One day one in person. I, I, I can't. We're on, we're on two sides of the country, and uh, and we've had wonderful conversations, and it was really good to talk face to face today. Next time we are going to be talking about Dick York's episode. Which is, what's the name of it? A Penny for Your Thoughts. A Penny for Your Thoughts, which is a little lighter in tone than this one. That's the nice thing about the Twilight Zone. Thanks for coming to the show. Uh, and we will see you next time here in, insert title of podcast here.